Hello, everyone. Welcome to Old News. My name is Laura Beth. I am your host. I have a visitor here with me. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to be your host, and so I'm going to keep an eye on the chat for all of our questions and comments. And we actually had a question for you in the chat to start us off. Um, we're talking about traveling to places with excellent fossils. So where in the world would you like to travel if you could go anywhere to look for fossils? Um, I think for me, I might go to South Africa or Madagascar because we talked about some awesome animals from there. Um, and what about you, Christian? Uh, hi. Um, well, I mean, those are those are places where I've worked on the fossils. Um, so I think of the places I have yet to visit that I would love to look for fossils in, number one is Antarctica because it has such amazing permo-triassic rocks. Uh, yielding the kinds of animals uh, that I'm so interested in are our own ancestors, the proto mammals. Nice. Yeah, Antarctica would be cool too. I don't know if I have the literally the guts for it. Yeah, oh gosh. <laughs> literally, it would be really cool. <laughs> um, and so thank you for joining us, Christian Kimmer. Always our, a pleasure. Um, museums Research Curator of Paleontology. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Tell us what's new, Christian. Yeah, so uh, this month we're going to be talking about some uh, sort of a grab bag of new discoveries from one of the world's most famous uh, fossil bearing deposits, um, one of these so-called uh, Lagerstätten, um, which are areas of exceptionally high quality preservation uh, of individual fossils and also exceptional number of fossils being produced. Um, we think of fossil finds as generally a pretty rare thing, uh, but there are some, some lucky areas on earth uh, that just have a just enormous uh, fossil riches. Um, so let's uh, situate ourselves in time as we like to do, um, looking at uh, sort of our geological time scale here. And we're going to be talking about uh, some of these Lagerstätten, specifically from uh, Northeast China, uh, that have yielded huge numbers of Mesozoic fossils uh, from the latest Jurassic and early Cretaceous. So sort of smack dab right in the middle of the, the age of dinosaurs. Um, so the vast majority of these fossils have been found in Liaoning province in Northeastern China. Uh, and most of them uh, belong to this group, the so-called uh, Yehol biota. Um, so this is uh, the most famous of all of these uh, Chinese fossil assemblages because it yielded the feathered dinosaurs. So this includes both things that, you know, uh, sort of the layman would recognize as dinosaurs as well as, as avian dinosaurs, the birds, uh, both in great abundance, both showing soft tissue details, such as the feathers, of course, uh, but also things like the, the gut contents, uh, skin preservation, uh, details of the claws and teeth, all of these really amazing details to these fossils that are so rarely seen in fossils elsewhere. Um, so the whole biota has, has become very famous since it really burst onto the scene with the feathered dinosaurs in the late 1990s. Um, but lately, there's been work done on another fossil assemblage called the, the Yan Liao biota, um, which also has preserved lots of incredibly, uh, you know, intact fossils showing details of soft tissue, such as feathered dinosaurs uh, and feathers in early birds. Um, so this is also found in Liaoning province, uh, but then also some of the fossils, including the ones we're going to be talking about today, uh, come from the neighboring uh, Hubei province. Um, so these two assemblages, uh, the Yehol and the Yan Liao biota, um, they are separated quite a bit in time. Um, they're both the result of these bursts of volcanism. So of basically volcanic ash is falling into a series of interconnected lakes in this part of the world in what was at the time Pangaea, um, which is causing this really spectacular preservation of all these fossils and this very fine volcanic ash covering them. Um, so the whole, it, the exact dates of these, they're still somewhat controversial, sort of like pinning it down to the million years point. Um, but it's now generally well accepted that the Yehol is in the sort of the middle early Cretaceous and then the, the Yan Liao is in the, the late Jurassic and maybe a little bit of middle Jurassic there. Um, so they are in two, two different periods. 
Um, that's interesting because the, the Yan Liao, that makes it roughly equivalent age to the really well-known um, German Lagerstätten of Zollenhofen, where things like Archaeopteryx come from. So these are now sort of tied as some of the oldest uh, oldest feathered critters uh, known anywhere, and certainly what we would consider the first birds. Um, so just again, to show the typical preservation in the Yehol and the Yan Liao, both really immaculate specimens there. Um, so I mentioned that it has all of these feathered dinosaurs and early birds in it, uh, which is, is true and uh, uh, shows a lot of sort of early diversification of the avian body plan. Um, but it also preserves some really weird groups uh, that seem to have been evolutionary dead ends, but sort of successful uh, at their time. So as their sort of evolutionary experimentation into the origin of flight. Um, so one of these groups is something uh, we've talked about on Old News before. We had an episode about this group, the Scansoriopterygids, which is a group of very small bodied theropod dinosaurs that were sort of bat winged um, flyers or gliders. Um, so that animal E that I just showed, and then also this animal Ampopteryx. Uh, there, there are now a number of the Scansoriopterygids known that have this uh, sort of extra bony element coming off of the arm that seems to have given them kind of like a bat winged morphology. So a totally different approach towards flight uh, than what we know would eventually be successful in birds, uh, which was to cover the arm in feathers. Um, so a lot of diversity even in, in the the theropods in the trees. Um, and it's not just uh, reptiles that are doing it. So from these same beds and the same uh, biota, um, there's this animal myopatagium and then other closely related things like Villa volodon and more distantly related uh, early mammals like Volaticotherium showing that uh, these little fuzzballs and you can see uh, there is fur preserved on that animal to the left. Uh, had these extensive patagia, which are uh, basically the skin membranes between the arms and the legs that would have given them the ability to glide from tree to tree, much like living flying squirrels, although these are an unrelated group. Uh, these are not rodents. These are very archaic mammal groups. Um, so you've got multiple groups of theropods, early birds, mammals up in the trees. Um, and then they're the group that we'll talk, be talking about today, of course, the pterosaurs. So this is the Mesozoic. Uh, the skies are full of pterodactyls and their allies, this group uh, called the pterosaurs, um, which unlike uh, bats, which have sort of like all the fingers forming the wing and birds, which have the feathers forming the wing, pterosaurs had just the uh, one digit. Uh, so think of it like as a giant pinky finger, uh, which extended out to form the wing. Um, and there's a new species that was just described this past week um, from these Jurassic beds of the Yan Liao biota. This is an animal called Sinomacrops, um, which basically translates as Chinese big eyed one uh, because it's a member of this group called the Anurignathids, uh, which are very unusual pterosaurs. Um, mostly we think of pterosaurs as having sort of like long pointy beaks. Um, and these had very short skulls with gigantic orbits. So indicating they had very big eyes. Um, big eyes, also very broad mouth with sort of big recurved fangs. Um, so the group today is named after this animal, Anurignathus, from, uh, from Germany, from the late Jurassic, um, one of the, the Lagerstätten there that we, we mentioned earlier. Um, beautifully preserved, uh, and you can see it has, a, this one has a very short tail, which is the origin of the name, um, which means basically tailless jaw. So it's not totally tailless, but they're very short. Um, and there are more recent discoveries uh, also from some of these Chinese Lagerstätten like Yeholopterus um, has given sort of more information on sort of the, the covering of these animals. Um, so we know that they were, they were fuzzy. So here's a reconstruction of Sinomacrops. Um, this probably would have been very cute animals. Uh, they're very small for pterosaurs. So these things are sort of in the sparrow to pigeon size range. Uh, these aren't, you know, giant 20, 40 foot uh, wingspan things like you might think of uh, for a lot of the Cretaceous pterosaurs, which do get to become giants. Um, so these things, they would have been quite small flitting around the uh, the treetops, um, probably eating insects as sort of that the short face and sort of powerful teeth uh, are somewhat similar to what you see in, in living bats that are hunting insects. Um, 
So uh, this one did have sort of a longer tail and some of the neurognathids do have long tails. So there's some variability in the group. Um, and what's cool about this basically is, you know, there this group is previously known from the Jurassic and from this part of China. Uh, but it's just shown that there's actually an incredible diversity of these flying critters uh, in this part of the world at this time. Um, and just there's so many new discoveries being made in these beds. It's actually hard to keep up with them. Uh, in fact, uh, just yesterday, yet another pterosaur from uh, the same uh, sort of the same region from the Yanliao bi biota was described. Uh, this is a new species of a genus called uh, Kunpungopteryx, um, also known from a really beautiful intact skeleton. Um, and what's cool about this one, uh, which may have looked something like this, so these were, this is maybe more what you're thinking about with the pterosaur with sort of a big crest, uh, long pointy beak uh, with a lot of teeth. Um, but what's different about this one is the authors argue that it had opposable thumbs, which would have helped it clambering around up in the trees. Um, I got to say, when I first saw this announced, uh, I was a little skeptical just because so many pterosaur fossils such as these are basically preserved two-dimensionally, just sort of like squashed into a pancake. Um, but the, the authors did some very cool work um, with CT scans, uh, looking at the underlying morphology of these bones. Um, and I think doing a good job showing that this probably was a opposable thumb. Um, so the earliest record of that in pterosaurs and definitely I think more good evidence that a lot of this, uh, this fauna was up in the treetops. So not like uh, either on the seashore or like up on rocks as some later pterosaurs have been argued. Um, Another cool thing about this is that the this uh, new species, um, they examined some previously described pterosaurs from these deposits, including this very famous one, which is the pterosaur uh, preserved with an egg coming out of its body. So you can see here, there's, that's an egg coming out. So we know this was a female pterosaur. We know it was pregnant when it died. Um, the egg was uh, probably laid as after the body was, you know, already dead and just sort of like expelled during decay. Um, but the, the only, uh, or at least the earliest record of uh, a, a pregnant pterosaur um, and sort of new detailed anatomical exploration of this specimen as well show that this is also the same species of uh, Quinpongopterus. Um, so nice, a little compliment there, learning more about sort of the life history of these animals. Um, I should note that, you know, you have, there's also uh, this animal, which was described uh, a number of years ago, but it's from the same bed. It's this animal, Xianglong, um, which is a true lizard. So it is not a, a dinosaur or a pterosaur. It's a proper lizard, um, but it also would have been a glider. Uh, and it has these very extended ribs um, serving as a membrane for flight, much like living flying dragons. Uh, so when you put it all together, it really is a remarkable amount of aerial diversity uh, from the Yanliao biota. Um, you have multiple groups of feathered dinosaurs, bat-winged dinosaurs, early birds, different groups of pterosaurs, even flying lizards. Um, and it brings to mind just sort of a really an unusual amount of aerial diversity for a fossil uh, locality, um, but it's not completely unprecedented of an ecosystem. If you look at Southeast Asia today, there is comparable diversity in gliding animals. Um, and even more once you add true flyers like birds and bats. Um, if you look in countries like Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam today, uh, there's this whole complement of flying squirrels, uh, this group, shown in the upper right that are sometimes called flying lemurs, um, but they are, they are not lemurs, they're not primates. It's this group, the Dermopterans or Coligos, um, flying lizards, flying frogs, flying snakes, uh, this huge diversity of, of gliders. Um, and what comes of, uh, from this is that, you know, uh, there's been strong selection for gliding in this ecosystem among arboreal, or that is just tree dwelling animals in this ecosystem. Um, and what's been argued uh, is that this is very sort of close canopy uh, tropical forest. And so you want animals that can jump from one tree to another fairly quickly, either to get more food or to escape from a predator. Uh, and sort of an easy way to do that and make sure you don't hurt yourself is to glide. 
Um, you don't see comparable adaptations in rainforests, say in South America. Uh, and that's because there, the, the, there are very close canopy forests, but they're generally choked with vines and especially these large woody vines called lianas. So in that ecosystem, you tend to see more animals with a sort of a, a prehensile tails or sort of that are very good clamberers, things that are climbing from vine to vine to get from tree to tree. So if you're a gliding animal, you don't want to be like flying through the air and then getting like whacked in the face by random vines that knock you out or potentially knock you to the ground. Um, so we do see in these different uh, modern forest ecosystems, different approaches for how to be tree dwelling. Um, so based on the prevalence of flyers and gliders in this ancient Chinese biota, we suspect it was uh, a forest system very similar to what you might might see in some of these Southeast, Southeast Asian ecosystems today. Um, and this is the sort of environment that is actually very rarely preserved in the fossil record, just because uh, rainforest soil is generally fairly acidic, generally bad at preserving fossils of any kind. And these gliders also tend to be very small, very light boned. Um, so they are, have a very poor preservation potential. They rarely become fossils. Um, so really, again, this is where the lager stet is, is sort of uh, really helping us out here, uh, preserving a snapshot of a really exceptional fossil ecosystem. Um, so really, you know, wonderful that we're learning so much about what's living up in the trees, uh, thanks to this exceptional preservation. That is um, awesome, Christian. And did, can I ask you a quick question about the yeah. new species from um, yesterday afternoon? I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do we have any information about, like, does that tell us any more about how to tell the difference between male and female pterosaurs, at least of that species? since they found one that was egg-laying? Yeah, so it's long been suggested that there is some sort of dimorphism between the sexes in pterosaurs, um, especially since so many of them have these very elaborate crests, uh, in which if you, you know, compare it to some modern animals, a lot of times like the males will have big showy crests uh, to try to attract females. Um, and it does seem like that is the case in some pterosaurs as well. Mm -hmm. So in this particular group, the Wukongopterids, um, there is some variation in uh, crest size. Uh, right now, we don't have quite enough data to say for sure that males always have big crests, females always have smaller ones. It seems very likely, um, but there's also a lot of potential, uh, you know, even like growth features to that. Like maybe if this is a juvenile or a teenage animal rather than a female, that's also a reason it would have a, a small crest. Right. Um, also, a lot of the crest would have been fleshy in life. So uh, a lot of times when we think about pterosaurs having crests, it's we're thinking about like Pteranodon, for instance, which has that famous sort of long crest on the back of the skull uh, mm -hmm. that is is bone. Um, but based on other Lagerstätten, especially like in, in Germany and then, then in the whole group, um, we know that there were extensive sort of soft tissue elaborations to the underlying bony structure of these crests. Like some of them would have been very big. Um, and even in uh, the Yan Liao biota, where we have such amazing preservation, we don't always see the full sort of soft tissue extent of the crest. So mm -hmm. even if you do have, uh, like, even if all the skulls look the same is what I'm saying, is we can't rule out, you know, males having much bigger soft tissue crests than the females. Right. Um, so uh, I think we're starting to get to the point where we have enough specimens to answer these sorts of questions with like rigorous statistical confidence, yeah. um, but we're, we're still working on it right now, sort of as, as paleontologists. Okay. And is it common for them to have opposable thumbs? So it may be more common than we realize. Um, I just sort of like rarely find that. Um, we know like some pterosaurs didn't have that. Like there are animals uh, like Ramphorhynchus and Pterodactylus that are you know, beautifully preserved in uh, like Zollenhofen, for instance, that don't show opposable thumbs. Um, so this is the earliest record of it, you know, that they can state with sort of a, a good degree of confidence that it was present. Um, but we can't exclude the possibility that some other pterosaurs had it as well. It is the sort of thing that is more likely to be useful if you're living in trees than if you're living like on a rocky shore um, because you wanna be holding on to two branches and sort of like manipulating your surroundings right. um, rather than just sort of like landing on all four limbs uh, on a beach side like a lot of these bigger fish eating pterosaurs were doing. 
the, the massive ones that yeah things like again like like, like tyrannodon um or the even bigger ones the asdarkids things like quetzalcoatlus mm -hmm. which are probably spending a lot of their time on the ground actually um they could fly uh at least all the indications are that they were capable of flight um but they would have been so big and so heavy uh, that I think a lot of their time would have been spent sort of walking around on the ground on, using on four legs, using the the wings as sort of like, uh, you know, as four limbs, um, and then probably feeding on small animals uh, that they would come across. And by by small, I mean, like smaller than them. I mean, these things were like nearly 20 feet tall. They're gigantic. Right. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. The, those are all my questions for now, um, but this is awesome. Are there any other fossils that you wanted to talk about from this particular locality yeah, in the treasure? Just, treasure well, just as a quick aside, let me let's uh, go to the Yehol biota. Uh, so the more famous of the two, um, but not talk about some of the the feathered things, some of the things up in trees, but rather kind of the opposite um, things burrowing underground. So also just from the past week, uh, there's been sort of two new uh, early relatives of mammals from these this assemblage. Uh, so these are animals that would have been living with, you know, some of these feathered dinosaurs and some of the later pterosaurs, uh, but maybe usually get a little less media attention, um, but are really remarkable in their own right. Uh, but the, I mentioned this discovery just because I want to note uh, how much it kind of breaks my heart. Uh, so don't get me wrong, this is an amazing find. So this is beautiful, new, complete skeletons of two early mammal relatives. There's one uh, that's a tritylodontid shown here, um, and there's one that's a triconodont shown here. So as you can see, these are amazing, complete skeletons, uh, beautifully preserved and so much better than most Mesozoic mammals, which are isolated teeth. Like if you're a Mesozoic mammal worker, this is kind of beyond the dream uh, to find this sort of stuff. Um, and they're also very informative ecologically. They have these very powerful, robust forelimbs that show you know, with good degree of confidence that these were diggers. Um, some of the first good evidence of, of burrowing in these groups, although it has been suggested before based on more fragmentary specimens. Um, but what bums me out about this discovery is that, you know, they don't have fur, or at least the fur is not preserved. So if we look at, uh, at a, this is a family history, sort of a family tree of mammals, uh, a phylogeny showing ma true mammals and their sort of extinct relatives, which is, again, the group that I, I specialize on as a scientist. Um, and the origin of hair is sort of one of the outstanding mysteries for those of us who, who work on mammal origins. Um, it's so well known, the origin of feathers in dinosaurs and birds now, in large part, thanks to these Chinese localities. Um, but we know comparably nothing about the origin of hair. So we know some groups must have had hair. So if you look at the modern groups of mammals, you've got placentals, which are most living mammals, things like rodents, cats, dogs, whales, hoofed mammals, ourselves. There's a lot of placentals out there. Uh, and then you've got the marsupials, um, the pouched mammals. And then this very rare nowadays, uh, they used to be more common, this group, the monotremes, the platypus and the echidna. Um, and all of these, of course, have fur. Uh, so we can say that ancestrally, all of this group uh, bounded by these modern mammal clades uh, would have been ancestrally furry. Um, outside of that, things get a little less clear. There are a few possible examples of sort of furry fossils uh, lower in the tree, uh, but for the most part, it's sort of a, a total gap in our knowledge. So knowing exactly where fur originated um, is, is really a mystery. And tritylodontids, uh, of which one of these two new Yehol animals is a tritylodontid. So these are not mammals. These are non-mammalian cynodonts. They're very deep into the tree. Uh, so this new tritylodontid, uh, Fossia manis from Liaoning, uh, is a tritylodont. And so if it was preserved with fur, it would, you know, vastly increase sort of the confident uh, part of the mammal tree uh, that we could say was, was for sure furry. Uh, but alas, despite being preserved in this in really incredible uh, uh, fossil lagerstätte um, that we know does preserve soft tissue like feathers, uh, not not a hair to be seen on it. So that if it breaks my heart, we were really hoping those of us who work on 
uh, mammal origins that when they finally found a non-mammalian cynodont in uh, the whole biota, at last it would prove that they were furry, uh, but no, no dice. So we're still waiting, we're still hoping. Um, it's amazing that this animal is there at all because uh, tritylodonts, as non-mammalian things, you know, they originated in the Triassic, and this is one of the the latest surviving ones, all the way into the the early Cretaceous. That's like a hundred million years of uh, the history of this group. Um, but and we strongly suspect they had fur, but still still no definite evidence of that. So just have to wait. Um, as this old news should indicate, there are new discoveries being made at these sites on a weekly basis. So I, I do think it's only a matter of time before we will be able to confirm furriness of tritylodonts. So just keep waiting until then. I can't wait. The origin of, of fur and hair one day, possibly next year. <laughs> hey, it could be, could be any time. Um, of course, I mean, what would really be exciting would be finding hair in an even more basal or more primitive group. So tritylodontids, like I am 100% convinced that they were they were furry. Um, but when you get into earlier synapsid groups, things like Gorgonopsians, even something like Dicynodonts, uh, some of these groups we've talked about before that are back in the Permian, um, it's possible they already had hair. Uh, there's no great evidence for it in terms of the osteology, just in terms of characters of the bones, which is what makes it so so tough to say where hair evolved. Um, but there are there are fossil sort of coprolites. There's fossilized dung from the Permian that has suspiciously hair-like structures in it. So it's suggesting that hair could have originated as early as the Permian. But again, we just don't have the hard evidence of like a fossil preserved with that, that halo of fuzz around it. Um, yeah. We need to find either get very lucky at a known site or find new localities that have this exceptional preservation of why that age. You, oh. no, yeah, so why do you think that the um, that we haven't found fossils with hair? Like, why doesn't that fossilize? And also, what exactly would we be looking for? Like, is it just skin prints that, skin imprints that have the hair, you know, imprinted into the, um, the fossil? Or would it be, you know, is there evidence we can look for in the bones or anything like that? Well, so I've mentioned this a little bit that there are some osteological indicators, which means things on the bone, uh, but none of them are definitive. So um, there is there are little holes in the skull that are passages for nerves uh, that innervate whiskers in modern mammals. Um, and you do see those appear in like some of the latest non-mammalian cynodonts in the Triassic. So those animals may have had whiskers, and if they had whiskers, they might have had some other kind of hair. They may have had fur. Um, but we also don't know like which evolved first, whether we don't know why hair evolved. So there are really two options. One is to sense the world around you, which is to say uh, with whiskers. The other is to keep yourself warm, which is to say with a fuzzy body. So if whiskers came first, then you know probably animals before the late Triassic cynodonts wouldn't have had hair, but if uh, kind of fur came first, then all bets are off. It could go way back. Uh, like I don't think like really early synapses, things like Demetrodon were hairy. I think that's probably ridiculous. Like mm -hmm. those would have been scaly animals, um, but into the therapsids, into these later Permian things, it's a real possibility. Mm -hmm. um, as to what uh, what sort of environment we need and why we don't see fur preserving as much. Um, I mean, part of that is has to do with taphonomy, which is how animals are preserved, how they decay and enter the fossil record. Um, so even in these like amazing Lagerstätten that preserve soft tissue, uh, feather preservation is more frequent than fur preservation. So you get these, uh, lots of these feathered dinosaurs and birds uh, and relatively few mammals with fur, although some of them like myopatagium that we showed does, does have the hair. Um, Cause you, it, you need to be like very lucky to even get any soft tissue preserved and then like extra super lucky to get the hair uh, just because feathers are more, they're a more resistant structure than for the most part than hair. Uh, they tend to be bigger. Uh, they also, at least in terms of the, the flight feathers, the wing feathers, they're more tightly associated with the body. So like the quill of a 
big wing feather is really deeply implanted onto a bird or a dinosaur's arm to the degree that actually you can see little little bumps on the bone, on the arm bones called quill knobs um, that those things are associated with. So they're on there really tight. Um, and so if you're preserving any kind of soft tissue, like some of the big feathers are likely. Um, with hair, you know, especially when they're in the water, those animals, the skin gets bloated, the hair falls out really quickly. Like if you've ever seen a, a waterlogged rat or a raccoon or something, you can probably see that a lot of the fur is already gone. And so put that under mud and, you know, wait for it to start to fossilize. You're going to lose a lot of it unless it is really like right away perfectly uh, preserved. So really, you know, we're fighting against um, lots of unlucky circumstances in getting fossil hair. Um, and so it, like even in cases like in, in Zollenhofen where you have Archaeopteryx that shows the feathers, we don't have any, any mammal skeletons uh, that really show fur. So the, there are some places on earth that uh, some of these other Lagerstätten that could potentially preserve them. Like in addition to these, these Chinese sites, there are some other ones in earlier Triassic sites in Central Asia, um, but they're relatively poorly studied and are currently inaccessible. So um, the hope is always that we'll find new ones. Um, and certainly there's a lot of world left to explore uh, mm -hmm. looking for, for new fossil sites. So uh, just have, have to get lucky. And so for it to be fossilized, for the fur to, you know, be preserved, it would have to be, the animal would have to be buried extremely quickly with like volcanic ash, right? Like completely. Yeah, something like that. Uh, I mean, the other forms of rapid deposition will also work, um, but they have to be also very fine grained. Like mm -hmm. if, if an animal, like there are places uh, like in the some of these dinosaur deposits in the Gobi Desert where we think that sand dunes basically collapsed on them and killed them instantly, but we don't have really good soft tissue preservation uh, just because the sand grains are basically big and rough and don't uh, don't preserve the soft tissue very well. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like really like tiny micron scale things like volcanic ash or mud or limestone is is better at that. So. Uh, an animal being like immediately covered in mud or like falling to the bottom of uh, an anoxic lake and then very rapidly getting covered in some sort of uh, fine sediment. All of these could work. Um, but again, even then is, is a rarity that you get the fur preserved. Right. I didn't realize that a sand dune could just collapse. Like oh yeah, it, it happens to people. Like it is, uh, it just it's, it's a real threat. Um, I guess, I mean, I, you know, I can think about like winds slowly changing a sand dune. That's what I think about, like with mm -hmm. our, um, the dunes along our North Carolina coast. Right. But yeah, I, I've never thought about it just suddenly collapsing. That's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, there are, there are a few cases and places I like, I know in, uh, Indiana dunes park where people are just like walk along the dunes and then just fall into them and, need to be extricated rapidly or they will suffocate. This is getting on into sort of a weird uh, Sorry, yeah. dark point, but, uh, but yeah. Do, um, let's think of something as, cute. As a real How thing. <laughs> Sino macrops, show me that picture again. That, um, yeah, let's, let's bring I, back Sino macrops. <laughs> this thing breaks my heart. It's so cute. I It looks like those things from Star Wars. Um, so, Oh yeah, the little the little puffin type things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, of the pterosaurs that would be good pets. Um, I mean, this is one that you could fit into your your hands and just kind of like have flitting around maybe on your shoulder. Uh, mm -hmm. Not the size of a a small aircraft, and thus mm -hmm. probably easier to keep in your house. Right, man. What I wouldn't give for a cynomacrops like pet slash friend <laughs> fly around me eat all the bugs you said they were insectivores right very likely yeah right. so we haven't found any gut contents of these particular ones that i'm aware of uh but a lot of the morphological features are suggestive that these were these were aerial hawkers of flying insects um which nowadays like uh modern bats a lot of that are things like moths 
Um, at the time, there were actually these moth mimics or butterfly mimics called uh, calligrammatid lace wings. So more closely related to the modern antlion uh, than to moths and butterflies, but very, very similar in habits. They have sort of long proboscis for uh, getting nectar and pollen and also these, these huge, very colorful sort of like patterned wings. Yeah. Um, um, we had an excellent observation in the chat from Chad that that is a flying frog. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, so the other than Ignorignathus, the earliest of these that was found is Batrachignathus, and that means frog jaw, literally, in right. ancient Greek. So yes, it is. They're, they are rather froggish as well, in addition to being kind of bat-like, uh, which also fits with them being insectivores. Like a lot of you know frogs are primarily eating uh, insects. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Well, you know, type into the chat if you have any questions, and if you if I don't see any questions, and we'll wrap things up in a few minutes. Um, I do want to ask Christian. You showed us a picture a while ago of a specimen of the um, the anura. Oh my gosh, the group that the Cynomacops is in. Oh, um, anurognathids. Yeah. Tail. Yeah, tailless jawed. So the pinky finger looked really, really long, like as long as the body, if not mm -hmm. longer. Is that, was that the pinky finger that I was seeing? Yeah, so they have this, the, what's called the, the hypertrophied phalanges of the, the, so it is, it's just one digit of the wing is the basis for the whole membrane. So it is, uh, it's kind of like the opposite of bats. They also would have had leathery wings, um, but rather than, most of the fingers making up the flight membrane and then just having one claw on that was free uh, for holding onto things. They had like a tiny little micro hand at the tip of the arm and then just one finger that was super elongated. Um, and they also had, uh, they did have stiffening fibers. So they're not quite like bats where it is, it's mostly just skin in between. Uh, they had these fibers called actinofibrils that would have made the the wing somewhat more resistant and sort of take some of the pressure off just that that one finger mm -hmm. um but still you know it's a it, it's a pretty delicate operation and if there was any damage to that bone the animal would almost certainly die because it couldn't fly anymore and it's also the sort of thing like it's not really easy to to heal back up again um i have not seen i actually don't know of any pterosaur fossils that like show uh, wings that have rehealed, like most of the time, if the wing broke, I think it was it was doomed. Mm. Yeah, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> well, if we, you know, if we had Sinomacrops vets, then we could we wouldn't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, we do have a question from Chad. Do we have any relations to I Know Dino podcast? I know I don't. Um, Christian, have you heard of that podcast? Um, I, I think I have heard of it, but, uh, but no, uh, we are, we are not associated yeah. with it. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll have to check those out though. Thanks. Yeah. And, um, so I'm not seeing any more questions, so we're going to go ahead and wrap things up. But before we go, I want to remind you all to join us again next month, mark your calendars for May 11th. And that is actually going to be our last episode of old news for this season. So remember the paleontologists, they take a, a break, a summer break, but it's to do a lot of work and go out to the field and collect and look for fossils and do some heavy research. Yeah, the, um, the summer break when we work harder than any other time of the year. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and so, so the summer old news break is going to be happening. So we will be back in September, but to help us celebrate the um you know the excellent season that we have had of old news with all of these discoveries we're going to be giving out awards to our species that we've highlighted so we're going to call it prehistoric awards and we need you to help us choose the winners for each category so we've got categories like best smile or um most likely to give you nightmares so check out the link in the video here in the video description um, for the Google form that will take you to our our voting voting form and we'll announce the winners in May in our episode on May 11th. 
All right. So um, thank you again so much, everyone, for joining. If you want to, you can also register for old news. Um, and that means that you would receive an email. Just as a reminder, you'd get bingo sheets, um, vocab lists for what's on the bingo, and any supplemental resources that come up. So thank you so much for joining us, Christian. Thank you, as usual, for um, sharing your expertise. And I've got to add some uh, creatures to our- Yeah, we've got actually added, added quite a few with this one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah, bye, everybody. Stay safe out there. Stay safe. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.